Om Yata Vacho Nivartante Aprapya Manasa Saha Ananda Brahmana Vidvan Naviveti Kutas Chaneti Om Shantihi 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 That one formless presence from which mind and speech falls back in awe unable to conceive or describe. The one who realizes the bliss of that Brahman destroys doubt and fear for all time. And so it is. Om peace, peace, peace. Om yo Brahmanan vidadati purvam Yo vai vedansya prahino hi tasmai. Tan hadeva at babudi prakasha. Mumok shurvai sharnam ham prapadje. Om shantihi shantihi shantihi. That one nameless, formless presence out of which sprung the divine trinity at the beginning of a cosmic cycle, which is the eternal bridge to immortality. Who delivered the Vedas unto Lord Brahma, who is partless, actionless, faultless, and divine. Who resembles fire, that has consumed all its fuel. I go for refuge to that eternal Brahman, whose light turns the attention of mankind to the Atman existing in everything. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Sahana, Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvi Navadi Tamastu Mahavidvishovahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. May Brahman protect us, may Brahman sustain us, and may Brahman illumine our thinking consciousness. May we not find fault with each other, with the teachings, or with the world. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Svagatam, we welcome you all here to the precincts of the SRV Association, Hawaii chapter, other than our chapters that we have in Oregon and San Francisco in a sense. We are in our third class of the topic of Viveka, I was thinking about it as I was ruminating yesterday and today, a, a way to preface it somehow that, that gives a, a full view of it. Because in the first two classes, we've, we've looked at the sort of discrimination last Sunday with the hilt and the blade and the third eye on it and the Sanskrit ruins in it, the bijams. And, uh, all the significance of that as given out by Adi Shankaracharya in the Viveka Chudamani. There's that word again, Viveka, even finding itself in the title of a profound scripture. And great teachers like Lord Vashishta call, called reality Viveka Gyan. This is this long lived relationship, you might say inseparable relationship between higher wisdom and the power to discriminate between 
the real and the unreal, as Vedanta likes to say. But the unreal quite often turns the Western mind away from comprehending what Vivika really is. So I was thinking about it and I thought, all the actions that people do in ignorance, in mindlessness, and uh, evil actions, uh, those all could said to be done in the absence of Vivika. And everything that a man or a woman, human being, would do for selfless reasons, and for dharmic reasons, for higher wisdom, for the good of all, loka sangraha, as Krishna calls it, the good of all lokas and all worlds, that is done in Viveka. So Viveka or Aviveka, as Lord Vishishti used to call it. Um, and so much so in the terms of the presence of Viveka that maybe sometimes even unbeknownst to the individual, when they started on the path and took a guru and selected uh, an ishtam and received mantra transmission from an illumined soul, like I did with Swami Sheshananda. I like this new setup here now because I'm not facing Swami Sheshananda and I don't have to look over my shoulder. May peace and bliss be upon him. Uh, so everything one does when one starts out on the path, if you're a sincere seeker, that is, you've got the goal of enlightenment firmly in mind as the goal, the paragatam, as Buddha called it, the supreme goal. One is doing all of that in Viveka. That is, maybe later you, you look back on what your teacher said, the words from the, the illumined soul's lips, and you look back uh, on the scriptures you read and all of the profound slokas and sutras there. And you realize that was just all Viveka. So it, it, when you walk through the, the gate of the new world, you see, that's an internal gate. You, you've left behind the old commonplace world where the, the bartering and bickering in the marketplace of mundane human convention <laughs> takes place, as Ram Prasad sings it in his song. Uh, then you've just stepped into the world of Ivica, and so much so that in SRV life we used to say that that people who are professing to be on the path and who are singing and dancing and, and uh, uh, who are meditating and various things, if you watch over a period of time you might think Maybe they didn't have that Vivica, that spiritual life didn't really begin until you could move forward in study uh, and in meditation and in devotions and in ritual and everything with that sword of Vivica, uh, of Vivica firmly in hand. Otherwise, it would have come to nothing. So last week, we showed you that chart. We finished up the chart that we started the week before on Vivika inside the bhakti path and, and uh, Vivika at the time of birth. And that means before you were born. And that's some of the charts I have for you today. And we looked at Vivika as its own quality, what it is and what it consists of in that sword of discrimination chart, uh, courtesy of Shankara. So that's how powerful and needful it is for a spiritual aspirant who's authentic and who really wants to call himself a seeker after enlightenment, or who, who, who chafes and struggles to get free from limitations and restrictions and maya, uh, to get beyond name, form, time, space, and karma, cause and effect and even beyond the three gunas and so forth that, that are constantly plaguing the mind, and beyond the dvandva mahayana, the, the pairs of opposites, good, bad, pleasure, pain, virtue, vice, and the ping-ponging effect that always causes in the mind day to day, keeping one away from just living in this eternal state of not two-ness, not a numerical oneness only, 
but an all-pervasive, and we've been saying lately, all-inclusive oneness. That is raised in the West, Western countries with the three religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all calling themselves monotheistic. Then we have to say that in the same sentence, their monotheism declares that there's a creator God, and it's never been the idea in India. Uh, so beyond monotheism would be what we call Advaita. Monotheism is a big impressive word. See? But you don't need to be as scared of it, it just means one God. But if you believe in one God, but your God is different than the God in your neighbor's house, <laughs> how can you call yourself monotheistic? If religions are warring against each other, then what happens to the one God? Even inside of one religion they war with each other, like Catholics and Protestants. So how could you really profess to love Jesus but, but uh, wreak havoc on your neighbor because had a little bit different version of that one God than you do? Like Sri Ramakrishna used to say about that, my watch keeps the only right time, is the idea of those people. So important to have this knowledge of something somewhere, some philosophy, some time, some group of great souls who got together and agreed upon what was called non-duality or Advaita as being all-inclusive, not exclusive. And when it comes down to separating the wheat from the chaff, which is the subtitle of our series of classes here, um, it's, it's going to take some, some wherewithal, some, some living intelligence inside of you to, to bring it forward and, and, and see the difference between, say, theology uh, in the West and science and, and uh, Vedanta and how uh, it's explained differently there, the, the nature of things like birth, creation, and uh, other categories that appear here, the origin of human beings, origins overall, because origin is a big thing in the religion of America and throughout Europe, that people raised in Christianity. And uh, so that's going to take some philosophical doing on your part to think about all-inclusiveness and then what is the role in Vivica in that, if you have to exclude something through Vivica. See, that's not, you're excluding things that need to be included. So there's two answers to that. One is that people are accepting admixtures to things all the time in the name of truth. So your Vivica is going to have to be a temporary practice that separates the wheat from the chaff. You're not, otherwise you're getting a meal that's, that's mixed with things that are undesirable. So there is an essence to a thing. And then there's its concomitants, you might say, those things that accompany it naturally, like Maya you know, accompanies Brahman. It's, it goes away in Brahman, but it's, it ha it's held in Brahman like poison is held in a snake. Sri Krishna said. So that's how you exclude it and include it at the same time if you're practicing deep vivika. Uh, and besides, what you discriminate away uh, doesn't do away with the one who's doing the discriminating. See? So there's always a sense of oneness, uh, I-ness uh, there that's that takes on different looks as you apply the sort of, of Vivica. First it's a personal I, and then it's an impersonal I, and pretty soon it's an all-inclusive I. And so your consciousness is simply moving through phases of itself. And some of those phases are dreamlike, and, but there's some that are outright illusory. Like I was talking to the son of a barren woman the other day about that. I'll pause here for us to think about that. 
you see. So I would told that to my friend. I was talking to a son of a barren woman the other day, and what are you talking about? You must be crazy. Show me this person, you see. So what we're saying here is there's some things that are a, are a, a part of the whole picture, which are illusory, which need to be seen through and discarded. Jesus, when he said, separate the wheat from the chaff, also said, get thee behind me. So he must have been talking about not a, a devil with a pitchfork and red horns, which is a metaphor, but all things devilish, which come out of your own mind. That is, it, it'd be like one of my favorite stories, which I wrote a God blog on the other day, the clay of consciousness, we're calling it, whereas the potter gets the shipment of clay from the countryside, and he makes pots out of it perfect pots because he's a master. He puts it in a kiln, fires it, takes them out after they're fired, and they're all cracked. And that's never happened to him before. So he goes back to his original material, which is clay. And this clay he got from the countryside, he finds it to be a, of an inferior grade. So he has to examine this clay with a microscope, you see, or a magnifying glass, and he sees all these little grains of sand and bits of glass and foreign particles in it. And he has to then spend a lot of time going through and taking out all of these little foreign particles from his material. Then he's got the pure thing. I find nice pictures of that on the web for my God blog. See? How, how really pure clay looks as compared to the raw stuff. You see? So uh, this is the clay of consciousness the Master's talking about, Sri Ramakrishna, the great Master, talking about that uh, if it still has these foreign particles in its thinking, then you're going to have to do this process of viveka. That is, you're going to have to knead that clay, examine it in depth. Like, like in Zen, they say how a, how a Eskimo studies snow conditions every day because his life depends on it. So your spiritual life depends on the next pots that you put in the kiln, which means putting it into the fire of yoga. You're going to purify it. Your, your consciousness is not going to get purified if it's, if, if it's got in, imperfections in it before you start engaging in, in intensities. So you don't intensify an impure mind, is basically the teaching. And the teacher knows that when you come, so he's not giving you austerities that advanced souls are jumping for. See? And sometimes people even jump for these austerities before they're ready for it. Oh, I think I'll go on a 30-day meditation uh, no, I said to my students, no, you're not going to do that. You're going to meditate one hour a day, like I told you to, like my teacher told me to. And that's how we got our peace of mind and our balance. Uh, otherwise, you blow the mind out of the water. You come upon things you can't handle, foreign particles unhidden that come out. Like Sri Ramakrishna said, dark specks in a white piece of white paper that you didn't know were there until you held them up to the light. So Vivica has all these aspects to it, or at least these several aspects to it, which one of them temporary. You have to separate, you have to take the weeds out of your garden until you have just a pure crop there, or they'll take over. And so you're going neti neti, right? Uh, not this, not this, until finally all this, all this occurs to you. Actually, all this, all this, iti iti, was the truth all along. But your mind wasn't purified and in a state to see that truth yet. It's just, it's like, like a child in school taking arithmetic doesn't have the slightest idea of what geometry is, is about. Can't, can't even think that way, you see. So spiritually, uh, if you're just starting out in the path, then you're going to need practices that are in, in uh, conjunction with uh, what you can handle. So, so that by avastas, by stages, you can step inward and uh, adjust to each level, like climbing a mountain, getting, getting used to the oxygen, the reduction of oxygen in the air, and, and waiting. Like if you climb out here, you know, Mauna Loa and b behind us, you know, they take mules up to the top. But even the mules have to stop and rest for hours when they reach beyond 10,000 feet. So, and you know, they have a lot more capacity than we do to adjust. So everyone's taking those steps at that high elevation, 
dragging their feet and getting used to not, not having oxygen anymore. So in that way, this increased practice of viveka and vairagyam, as you, that next week's class will, will take viveka toward uh, detachment, 12 levels of detachment that uh, you go through, that Swami Vivekananda told us about. But back here with little old us in materialistic America, uh, and uh, having just received the Vedanta in 1893 from a great soul, a living Buddha, Shiva incarnate, in the form of Swami Vivekananda, coming to us, to our very country, to our very shores, and bringing to us this polished gem of Vedanta, uh, the best of all darshanas of India. As far as non-duality is concerned, that's it. Yoga, that's more of a practice, at least uh, in the phase of practice, until you realize the true meaning of yoga, which is also the end result of having non-dual realization in Vedanta. <coughs> so he granted us this great precious gem of Viveka, and with Viveka comes Vairagya. So you've got the three Vs there, three victories, Vedanta, Viveka, and Vairagya, and then you've got Vivekananda coming to teach you this, you see. And he's got the Viveka Chudamani in his left hand, <laughs> you see. He's got Yoga Vashishta with its Viveka Gyan in his right hand. So like I just was trying to explain, it's just all Viveka when you enter into it. And if you don't have it, you don't have a spiritual life yet. That's my harsh assessment it's from what I've seen in the West in my 50 years of sharing the Vedanta with people. Harsh assessment. Where are our Jivan Muktas? And not just me, my teacher used to stand on the podium saying, you've produced some scientists, you've produced some quantum physicists, a few good artists, but where is your Jivan Mukta? India has hundreds of Jivan Muktas it's produced throughout time, and you haven't produced a single one yet because you're still caught in the intellectual frame of reference. Well, if you're working with the intellect, uh, and that's unquote. So if you're working with the intellect, then that sort of wisdom is, is going to expand your intellect because your intellect holds intelligence and intelligence is unbounded. It only gets seemingly bound when you put an intellect around it. See, part of the fourfold mind is the intellect. That's antaha karna, the fourfold mind in India. They looked at the mind and got the best assessment of it in all of philosophy. Dual mind, thoughts, chitta, that go with it, the ego that rides along, and uh, buddhi. Uh, Buddha took that word for his own name. Then that's ultimately and eventually, in the case of the seeker, uh, that's um, living intelligence. Uh, the fire of yoga, that, like the kiln that your, you know, the pots of your body mind mechanism are getting introduced to every lifetime, and uh, that maybe brings me a little closer to home in the third class today. Is that that's the part of Vivika we want to look at today? Is is uh, birth, life, death, and rebirth, and uh, it goes well with just what naturally has been coming to me on my philosophical platter lately is that a restudy of the Tibetan Book of the Dead that I went deeper into and looked at some 40 to 60 different translations of that work since 1920. It, came, it, was, it was hidden in Tibet for a couple hundred years by Padma Sambhava because I think people in Tibet were not ready to look into this. It's sort of like people here, we're, we're really not looking at where I came from and where I'm going. So I wrote this God blog yesterday, as this man walks into the room, you see, and he says, or this man is going to see his friend. See? So he just came from his Dharma class, like all of you will be in three hours. He just came out of Dharma class, he's got a Gita in his hand, and he's walking out towards his friend's house. So he gets to his friend's house and opens the door, and his friend's packing a bag. So he says, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I'm preparing for a vacation. 
And then his friend looks back and says, what are you doing? So Gideon has, I'm preparing for my next lifetime. <laughs> so this is the subject on the minds of Dharma teachers in Tibet, although the Tibetan Book of the Dead was hidden for a couple hundred years, even in Tibet, and brought out once Buddhism had finally influenced Tibet to get beyond the Bon religion, which is a lot of magic and superstitions in the name of religion. And that's why you see Tibetan Buddhism is this very unique form of Buddhism now with all these Buddha fields and tankas, you've seen them, you see. That's still some of the old Bon religion influencing that it came right out of Tibet. They, they, they kept the best of the Bon religion and it got grafted on to Buddhism. One of the best examples of polytheism that's really monotheism, if you ask me, is the one Buddha in all his emanations. So looking into some of the better translations of the Tibetan Book of the Dead has um, caused me to think about discrimination in it, probably its most important aspect to us today, right now is that we need to be looking towards preparing for our next lifetime, most of us. Vivekananda said, well, he took a look at us in the West, he said, well, it's probably the case that none of you are going to get enlightenment. But we might be able to get it as a group, he said. It was a very interesting uh, observation he made. Well, not so interesting. The first one's a little bit unhappy news. But I mean, look around, what do you expect? Krishna is saying in the Gita, only one out of a thousand comes to know of me. Only one of those thousand comes close to me. Only one of those thousand knows me as I truly am. So you have thousands and thousands of people who are just on the samsaric wheel. How does the Tibetan Buddhist Book of the Dead say that? Stumbling crazily through samsara. <laughs> that's, a, that's a direct translation stumbling like a crazy fool through samsara. Most people are doing that, having no idea of where they came from, who they are, and where they're going. Not even in the relative sense. I mean, if, if you knew and accepted rebirth and reincarnation, and you also knew there's a non-dual truth behind it that the monks are seeking, or if they're in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the monks don't need to hear that. They already gave up the world. They should be about merging. So uh, if that is coming to you in a country like this, then this is your chance to waken up to some of the facts of relative existence, not just call it Maya and try and get it behind you and then have it snap back on you later, see, and bite you in the posterior see, at the worst possible times in your life. Uh, that's called suffering and cycles of, of uh, misery and so forth and pleasure and pain, the duality is going back and forth again. So if you, if you look at then the, the tool and the import of Viveka, the discrimination between the real and the unreal, or between the essence and the non-essence, uh, however you want to put it, between Brahman and, and its Maya, between Purusha and Prakriti, between the Supreme Soul and the individual soul, Paramatman and the Jivatman, however it falls in the spectrum of your particular tradition or what you're seeking with the Gyanam that you get from the sword cut of Viveka Gyan, the sword of Viveka, then you're probably going to be looking at, in that tradition, three lifetimes, so they say. Three lifetimes, one to recognize that you're in ignorance, you're bound, and one lifetime to do the practice that frees you, and the third lifetime to be free. And it's in that second lifetime that you are practicing that the, the penultimate realization would be to get to a conscious death. I mean, people can even be hearing great truths like there is no such thing as death. You got the same time you're reading Krishna talking about one, one person in a thousand knows me and one in that thousand knows me, at the same time, he's, he's giving you out these teachings of the Supreme Purusha that doesn't come and go. 
in the cycle. It's, it, it, it's uh, like I chanted at the beginning of the class, it, it's a constant. Oh, that Supreme Brahman, nameless and formless. It's partless, actionless, and divine. So actionless, you, you, you know, the seers of the Upanishads are, t are telling you this in English. It even translates into English, which I, I think is one of the better languages in the world today to, to place Sanskrit in. And I, I've got European students that are going, you know, you're right. So it needs to be, of course, it's being placed in different, many different languages, like the Gospel of Ramakrishna. I was there in Japan in the 80s when I met the Japanese couple who were actually working on the translation of the Gospel of Ramakrishna. And their kimonos and everything, and a nice house at the, in Zushi at the Vedanta Society there with Swami Siddhartananda, of all things, <laughs> presiding over that center and introduced me to the Jap little Japanese couple who are translating the gospel into Japanese and beautiful. So, so this kind of work has to be done. And uh, it's going to take somebody who's got a handle on uh, Viveka, uh, who, who, who knows what separating the wheat and the chaff is all about. And, and then once you do that, detach from the chaff because you probably say some people's spiritual indigestion as Sri Ramakrishna said, there's a, they have a jumbled, mixed jumbled spiritual mood. Uh, so they haven't done the separation process, pushed the chaff away, seized the essence, and taken it, ingested it, digested it, and, and then brought it into life and shared it with others. So Vivekananda has, ha, has a very important role in, in, in Bhakti, as we were saying last week, it'll cause you to love God more than the world. Uh, or maybe if you want to put that in a converse way, say it'll cause you to, to uh, realize that the world's not worth loving. <laughs> because if you can get that out of the way, get thee behind me, then God in all these various forms will come dancing forward to you. And you'll, you'll be like Sri Ramakrishna, just in love. Uh, and, and you'll know it to be beyond emotional love. This is a particular problem right now in America. And uh, even beyond human love, although we need lots of human love. Uh, Zen Roshi married my wife and myself. We had written our own vows. You see. One of them was, may we go beyond human love. And he said, well, let's change that. May we have more human love you see. and also be able to go beyond to divine love. So it's, it's important. That's the all-inclusiveness, right, of, of, of the whole thing. All-pervasive, all-inclusive, the best words I think, in, and because I go through the English dictionary once every five years and uh, call out words that could be used for a new Vedantic dialogue in the West, uh, which ones will work and which ones won't. Because the culture isn't, hasn't been raised in spirituality. It doesn't even have dharma. I had a show of hands the other day. How many people had parents who raised their children in dharma? And nobody put up their hands. See? So it's, it's something that we need to, to um, inculcate in ourselves. Like Vivekananda saying, I don't want you, I don't want your child, I want your grandchild. He, he means, of course, he'll take all of us and he loves all of us and he'll teach all of us. But it's going to take a couple generations, like three lifetimes, you know, to, to, to bring this current so that, so that uh, we will understand the full implications of the Dharma. Not, not just a few words from uh, some moral parents, maybe that uh, had some idea about ethics, doing good. Because you do good to the world and then bad happens. You do bad to the world and good happens. It's always been the case and it always will be the case. We're not looking for a utopian society in Vedanta. We don't believe in that. Let Greek and Rome go that direction and see what happens to them when they do. 
we're, we're looking for eternal life, like Jesus explained. Even if Judas didn't understand it, you know, and got him crucified because you're supposed to bring perfection on earth today, was his attitude. But Jesus knew that wasn't going to happen. The sky of awareness Jesus, Jesus was talking about, it, it's there. It's, it's already there. You just have to open your eyes and see it. Knock and it shall be opened. It's always on it. It's always upon us. So, so the knower of consciousness who's got Vivica in hand you know, is um, already aware of the fact that perfection is. And that imperfections just need to be discriminated away. Like the clay of consciousness. So you take out the foreign particles. And I want my vision to be perfect. Vivekananda, I, uh, Shankara, they ask him, you're, in, you're illumined at six. At eight, you're illumined in a past lifetime. Why do you still do practice? And he said, so others will see me doing it and they'll do it. And number two, because I want the mirror of my mind wiped clean every day so I can have the perfect view of Brahman at all times. So it, it shows that the mind is not Brahman, number one. And it shows that the mind can collect impurities, number two. And it probably shows that number three, the mind is a mixture of impurities and purities. It, it's its nature. So you, you don't go and say, well, you've got to purify your mind. That means you have to realize the pure mind. It, it's like a mud puddle. You know, when you're a kid playing, you say, oh, it's so sail your boat across it. It's so beautiful, but I made a mistake of putting a stick in it and stirring it up. And for days I went back to that mud puddle and the sediment was still floating, I never got the clear pool again. See? So you don't want to intensify an impure mind. Drag up all the impurities out of there and think that maybe you can get rid of them all. Just do the mantra. It'll settle the, the silt quicker than any other method. Except maybe Vivica again, but back to what we're saying. Uh, we don't understand that. W why do we not understand that? I mean, I cut the teeth of some of my young children, that is, my young spiritual daughters and sons, on this chart at the river retreat uh, years and years ago, maybe a decade or more ago. And they all came up to me after and said, that's, that's marvelous. They had gone to Catholic school and high school and been raised by parents who were good parents but did not know the Dharma. And this side-by-side -side reckoning that I came up with, I did it first with two of the, let's call them theories for now, two of the theories in the world, you know, science and, and spirituality. And I thought, you know, basically that I could do it better. I kept that chart, but I could do it better with three categories here. And you can see it here, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I want to get to to the birth, life, rebirth, I mean, sorry, birth, life, death, rebirth part of the class. But this is why we can't understand that, uh, because we, we have this uh, indigestion. We have this mixed mind that's a, a, it's always a combination of good and bad. And we have this intellect that hasn't gone beyond the intellectual frame of reference yet. Uh, so we don't know what's waiting for us in our own self. Uh, we have an open nadis back you know, in, our, in our mind, not in our brain. I found a good image for one of my God blogs the other day, which is this x-ray of a skull, you see, an x-ray of a head, and there's a skull in it, and somebody superimposed inside the skull this, this little hamster running around in a wheel, you see, inside of the brain. <laughs> so, I, well, that's it, you see. Talk about recurring habit. And I just come upon two quotes, one from Meister Eckhart and one from Lord Buddha, about that same problem of habitual uh, pr procedures. So um, we can't really step on the path with, uh, with, with a definite conclusion made. Uh, the words in Sanskrit are siddhanta or vedanta dindima. Those are two ways of expressing in Sanskrit 
that the Sears made a definite conclusion. It, what we're saying here is they got off the fence. I mean, I would say probably most of the Westerners are, they don't even know there is a fence, see, uh, that there are two sides of a fence. They're just settled into matter. That's it. They won't even think of God even by accident. Who said that? Sridham <laughs> Krishna, who, by the way, if we want to sweeten the pot about him, and there's a song about Vivica in, in accord with him that was written. <laughs> Eshetche nutan manas dek bi jodi ai chule. Eshetche nutan manas dek bi jodi ai chule. Tarvive kavai ragya juli. Vive kavai ragya juli. Duli kante sada juli. Tarvive kavai ragya juli. Vivek Vairagya Juli, Dui Kante Sada Jule, Eshete Nutanamanus Dek Bijodi Ai Jule. I sang this in Kasipur Garden House in front of 10,000 people with Lex Hickson on the stage on one side of me and Taba Player on the other side from Calcutta. And the minute I started into this, they all started clapping. Some of them started standing up and dancing out in this huge garden house where Sri Ramakrishna passed away into Samadhi. Uh, the pieces I sang before and after, they just sat there, no clapping. As soon as this came on, you see, well, of course, this is the hotbed of Sri Ramakrishna in Calcutta, Kolkata, I'd like to say. Kali, the, the Calcutta is, is sort of the English version of that, but Kolkata means Kali's place, you see. So, uh, and I'm not even sure that um, many of them, although they were Hindus, knew what this meant, but it basically it's, oh friends, um, I've found a new man, Nutan Manus, Eshete Nutan Manus, so a new Manus, a new mind. Manus means mind. So I found a new man. Uh, and if you want to see him, come with me, basically. He, Tar Viveka Vairagya Juli, when you, when you see him, you have to realize he's not some great spectacle outside. He's, he doesn't have anything. But if you look closely, you'll see he's got this shoulder bag around him. And if you ask him what's in it, he'll share it with you, take it out, uh, unzip it, and show you, and you won't see anything there. But he'll explain to you, he's got Viveka and Vairagya in there. Viveka, the realization of between the real and the unreal, and Vairagya, the ability to detach from the unreal. Because this is going full circle, you see. So you make that definitive conclusion that I have to separate the wheat from the chaff. And so I'll know what the difference is. So now I know the chaff. The chaff is the body. The chaff is the five senses. The chaff is the ten objects of the senses. The chaff is the subtle senses in dream. The chaff is the ego. The chaff is the mind. The chaff is the intellect. And, and now I know it. I can put it aside. You see. It doesn't sound right away like all-inclusiveness, does it? But this is a practice you need to do if you didn't already know prior to meeting this great soul or these great souls that this was always been the case, that only Brahman exists. So the human mind, the, particularly the collective human mind, that is all the way to your ancestors and back, is peppering relativity with misfiances, with errors, with half-truths. And basically, uh, it's not just not keeping the field clear and pure, but it's actually allowing and assuming that things that aren't real are real, you see. And then once they seem real, centering in on them. I am the body. You don't even know about your dream body and your causal body yet. 
but you just found the physical body and you said, I'm going to glom onto that, and that's your death grasp on the atomic particle, and you'll not let go. You'll not let go even when great teachers come. You see what's in this bag? Viveka and Vairagya. The distinction, the knowledge between the real and the unreal, and then the ability to draw back from the unreal so that the real stands forth. Like the old 60s sitcoms. Will, will the true self please stand up? See, there was some sitcom back there. So three people were masquerading to be the same person. Or will the real one please stand up? You know, so a couple of them began to move, you see, and the audience was like, finally one would stand up and they'd all applaud. You see. Oh, I got it right. No, no. Will the real please stand forth from the unreal? Is what what the sword is availing you of, the ability to cut away that, and know without a doubt. So there's your conclusion. You have then your Siddhanta, and you're free. And if you're, you're free philosophically, because if you're not free philosophically, you're not going to be free in any other way. You're going to take a victory over another nation in war as freedom. So, so there's your peppered with admixture, misfeance, misconception. You're going to take the search for many as the goal of life. So there you are. You want to include that in? <laughs> Do oil and water mix? You tell the children, see? Oh, yes, Babaji, they mix. But if you put that there and watch it for 45 seconds, you'll see that they don't. So this is why you need Viveka. You need to know that what I'm seeing is an appearance. Probably most of what I'm seeing is an appearance. Bodies, minds, senses, objects, intellects, intelligent people, moral people, people going to churches and not knowing the truth, people going to churches and never getting free, People proclaiming my religion is the only religion. I'm monotheistic and you're polytheistic. But you're saying, but what about non-duality? Have you gone to India and studied Advaita yet? So you go to these great souls. And oh, this great soul, Sri Ramakrishna, that ship only leaves port about 500 once every 500 years, you see. <laughs> that ship only leaves port about once every 500 years. It's one of the names of my god blocks. Because you can trace 500 years back beings like Chaitanya and Shankara and Patanjali and Jesus and Buddha 500 years before him. And then it gets a little foggy. But uh, back to Krishna and then way back to Ram. So if you want to see him come along with me, he holds in his hands a shoulder bag. Inside of it, he's got Vivaka and Vairagya there. And this is a new man. He's come in an age of materialism, when everything is as dark as it can be. But when everything is as dark as it can be, then the light shines even brighter once you penetrate through the darkness. And that darkness he's telling you is not real. That's one of the things you have to discriminate away, is that things are all dark. Suffering's not real. Death is not real. Bondage, not real. Om pramadena nan son deha kim karishyam ivrittimon utpadjante viliyante budbuddhascha yata jale. Ignorance is unreal says the arbitrate. So it cannot cause you any real doubt. If you're laboring with doubt, then you have to see where does doubt come from? Oh, it comes from ignorance. But the seers say that ignorance is not real. So people with their minds are doing all sorts of projections. It's called sankalpa. Krishna says you cannot be free if you engage in sankalpa. sankalpa. It's not possible. You have to give that up. Fantasy, dreams, projections that aren't real or are mixed. You have to make your stand against that. 
But the yogi, what are his projections like? The Abhijit said. Well, he, they arise in him every day spontaneously. He doesn't resist them. They just arise in his mind spontaneously. At the end of the day, he will dissolve them all back like bubbles into water. Buddhist cha, yata jale. Jale is water. So this is how he lives in yoga, how he's made his final confirmation, his conclusion about everything. It's all unreal, it's all changing, however you want to put it. And it rises in front of me and falls. It rises in front of me and falls. Sounds Buddhist, doesn't it? Yeah. Why not? Buddhism came out of India. Buddha was an Indian man, not a Japanese man. Christ was a Middle Eastern man, not a Haole, as we say here in Hawaii, not a Caucasian. So uh, you look at things the way they really are, and Vivica will allow you to do that. So if you take a quick look at this chart, it's comparative views between origination, nature, consciousness, and life death. So this will introduce us to the charts that we're going to get to soon about birth, life, death, and rebirth. What I'm saying here in this class is possibly more important for people on the path or who want to get on the path sincerely than teachings of higher merit, Atmagyan, uh, non-duality, and so forth. Because uh, we find ourselves here in this, this uh, uh, negotiation Know, with Maya and with, with truth and with our ancestors and all, to try and find our way to that first lifetime that sets our foot on the path towards getting free, whether it takes us three lifetimes or six months, Vivekananda said. So there you see, what is the origin of consciousness? It, it would be a, if you ask that to a Vedantist, he'd, he'd just smile and he wouldn't know what to tell you. Is it's like you've got an illness. There's no origin to consciousness. The, the question is wrong. So you see, I mean, you're not using your Vivica. It's certainly not philosophically. You can't pull the wolves over an eye of a truth, over the eyes of a truth knower. What is the origin of consciousness? So, you know, so I have to put it up here because that's the way two thirds of the world thinks. Probably more in this age. But there you see Vedanta's idea is consciousness has no origin being anterior to life and mind. That's right out of the Mundaka Upanishad. It's anterior to life and mind. You say you were reading that, Mundaka Upanishad, and somebody was memorizing it a few months ago, and so forth. So uh, consciousness is anterior. It's a nice word. It means it, it came before. So wow, it came before what? Life. Well, I think I can grok that, you see, because life had a beginning, right? No, that's not where we're going with this. It's even before mind. Well, I'm not catching your gist here. Mind gave rise to bodies that live. So I'm going back to the origin of everything, which is the mind. It's the mind-only school's time. Welcome, you know, welcome to our neighborhood, the Vedantic neighborhood. This is the way philosophies in India are, uh, are, are based in mind-only schools. When the mind starts vibrating, everything happens. When it stops, it stops. And God stands beyond that, not affected by either. Actionless, perfect, divine, and so forth, we just chanted. So that's an eternal verity that has no beginning, middle, and end, says Krishna in the Gita. And so you don't go there when you talk about origins. And my feeling is that Christ, the religion of Christianity, got a bad start because they started talking about origins and because Christ mentioned in the beginning was the word. So that gave them the clue, you see. Oh, now I'm going to think in terms of the word starting everything off. Well, that's true. It's a very good teaching. It's been in India and Tibet and China for a long time that the word is behind everything. It, it's, the Tantra is based on the power of the word. The Mantra is based on the power of the word. The Vedanta is based on the power of the word. 
the Siddhanta is based on the power of the word. That's mantra, tantra, Vedanta, and Siddhanta, you see. Do they all rhyme just as a coincidence? It's all based on the power of the word. However, in the beginning was the word. The word is with God, but it was God. It was explained in the Garden of Gethsemane to John by Jesus after meditation. So the, the whole truth of the matter is, is that there's something beyond the word. When the word merges in Brahman, vacho nivartante, we just chanted, right? Yeah. And uh, Shankara says the same thing. You, you've got to take all of these objects and words and join them to the mind inside, then join the mind to your intelligence, inside, then join those three to the ego. That's where you started off thinking that all of this was separate than God. And why you projected objects with your mind and worlds in company of and cahoots with billions of other souls. That's a lot of power. It's a lot of mental power there that can cause things to happen, have worlds to form all started back with the Trinity at a very, very causal level, but your part in it came later. And, and so then you merge the ego to the, into the witness. Oh, well, there's a witness of all this, you see. And everything becomes all of a sudden peaceful, you see. It's like moving to Hawaii from Portland, you see, right now. <laughs> wow, it's so peaceful here, she told me the other day. So, is the minute you get out of the clutches of the ego and you see the, the witness that's been watching all the time, watching the whole process, that's where peace begins. It's not the peace that passes all understanding yet, but that will happen when you dissolve the witness back into the Atman. And then the Atman into Brahman. Why? Because Brahman is the soul of everything. Soul, capital S, of everything, as I just chanted. I go for refuge to the Supreme Brahman, whose light attracts humanity's attention to the Atman within them, within everything. That's that non-dual presence. So no origin. It's anterior to life and mind. It's about as clear as you could put it. But what does theology teach us in Genesis? Consciousness is born in time and space and passes from state to state. That's called heaven, earth, to hell. Well, if you say that to a Vedantist or a Tantra, says, oh, you mean these three lower chakras? <laughs> Is that what you're ta ta talking about? Yeah, I can agree with that. Three lower states, heaven, earth, and hell, or humans, ethereal beings, and ancestors. Yeah, going back and forth. See. That's, uh, again, why birth, life, death, rebirth is important to know about. But what does science say? Consciousness develops in nature as body and mind evolve. So you, well, you have no consciousness unless you have a body. And the body comes first and then the brain later, see. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is making less sense to the Vedantists than theology is on this point. My teacher used to say, Science is a greater friend of Vedanta than theology is. And he was talking about on points other than the origin of consciousness, because there is no consciousness. I mean, you talk about it having a beginning. I'll argue with it that it doesn't have a beginning. But science, science thinks that it somehow develops in nature. The intelligence comes after the body, after the womb, uh, the seed and, and, and the egg in the womb that develops into a, a, a fleshy orb and a fetus and so that and gets ejected out of the womb and on and on outward. It's just already outward and it's continuing further outward. And then intelligence, we hope maybe comes to that brain in the future, maybe at 30, 40 or 50 years old. See. Oh, is there some intelligence there now? Not if you believe this way. Because to us, intelligence is living intelligence that's anterior to life and mind and has no origin. It is. All of this is. 
Uh, but if you take it and do your sankalpa with it, then you're in trouble. If you take it and do samyama with it, then you're free. Sankalpa, samyama. Sanyama, sankalpa. Which one shall I take? You see, shall I meditate it as a as a eternal principle inside of unoriginated consciousness, as Gaudapada says, or shall I take it and play with it, with my mind, and the minds of my family, and the minds of my ancestors, over periods of time called yugas, and then not recognize Krishna, not even be one of a thousand that recognizes Krishna when he comes to earth, when his ship leaves port every 500 years. Vedanta Consciousness is one indivisible mass, self-aware by nature. I like it, I like it. Theology, consciousness is divided into many separate souls. There's a problem, you see. Then, then it's not all one, is it? It's not indivisible anymore. And you've taken the unreal to be the real. You've taken the appearance to be the actuality of the thing. And science, consciousness only exists in association with the brain. It's like, knock you on the head and you go unconscious, well, then you're not conscious, right? Or you go to sleep tonight, you leave your senses, you're not conscious. Your dreams mean nothing. Even your body goes on producing nails and hair after it dies. But you don't think the mind can go on producing sankalpa and life's inside of itself with ancestors when it passes? <laughs> Vedanta, consciousness is ever free and transcendent of creation. It's a create. It's a word Vivekananda gave to us to help us when he came here. Oh, I think you see, you're calling your religion monotheistic, and the next breath you're saying God is a creator. I, I don't even see how that can be. It doesn't make sense to me, he said. So I'll give you a new word. It's called a create. I mean, it, it was never created in the first place. In fact, Tempest in a teacup. You see, creation, preservation, and destruction are just going on as a little tempest in a teacup inside of these two great hands called Shakti power and Brahman behind her. So, in theology, consciousness depends upon a creation and a creator. How can we get beyond that? Atlas shrugged, but Ottman didn't. That's how I'm trying to get beyond it. You see, the West just believes in transformation. Anything that happens by movement, they run and look at it. But India believes in Ottman doesn't shrug. There is no change. There's no change worth looking at, except from this fact of Viveka. Oh, I see it changed. Oh, it changed again. Then changed again, Vivekananda said. And I keep watching, it's just a series of changes, and I'm sorry I got tired of that. And I decided to go back to the origin of the thing and see that its foundation was unchanging. The mutable, the immutable. So Viveka causes the real, the unreal, uh, the indivisible, the divisible, the immutable, the mutable. I've got to always use that sword uh, and words, the power of words, to clear out the philosophical terrain free my mind of bronti darshana, false seeing. That false seeing is in everything. From the way your parents raised you to the educational system in society, it's all based on false seeing. They're not seeing the truth. You can only see the truth if thine eye be single. So, like say, many of these cases Theology would be a greater friend to Vedanta than science would. Science says consciousness is dependent on matter and energy, so that's what we're reduced to, you see. <laughs> and the last one, consciousness assumes forms but remains ever formless. If you want to Give a concession, a, a, rec a, a conciliation. See, oh, okay, we'll go this far with you, like this last one. 
in theology. Consciousness depends upon a creation, a creator. Uh, and uh, we'll go this far with you. That basically, it can, consciousness can assume forms, but it's never one with them. It's, it can associate with them, but it will never identify with them. You, 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 you'll never find Brahman inhabiting a form. You always find it behind as a substratum. Master Eckhart said, the ground of, ex of existence. It's the ground of existence, you see. Existence with a capital E. So there's where you'll use your discrimination on that level too, to look behind appearances and see this unchanging reality that enwraps souls for long periods of time, like 49 days under the bow tree, for instance. Just look at that, just look at that. I'm looking and it's not changing. I go to refuge in the light of that Brahman, in Buddha nature. I went into Stiti Samadhi, 12 days and 12 nights in the wilderness, looking at the light of the Almighty Father, the, the Great Spirit. And then I came out and pro proclaimed, I and my Father are one. I saw the removal of all distinctions. You don't think he was using a very powerful sort of discrimination to do that? with the Romans on one side and fallen Jewish tradition on the other. Talk about a press where you couldn't get together like this in a room without people with armor and swords coming in, killing you or hauling you off for crucifixion or hanging. What would you like, crucifixion or hanging? See, the old Monty Python skit. To line them up, see. Choose your poison. So in theology, consciousness is born in a form. So where's this idea? Because heaven has forms too, you see. Well, how can we get beyond heaven? The heaven-aspiring senses, the Vedas say. You know, they got beyond, beyond the heaven-aspiring senses. So you know they got beyond earth, the nether realm, and the ancestor realm, all three to find this formless reality. And it got more and more formless the deeper they went into their own consciousness. It's just like, you know, the idea of form could not exist in that atmosphere. Uh, just like a moth can't exist in a bonfire for very long. It just burned away everything. And it was just a thing in itself then. That, with a capital T, they talk about giving up all words. Oh, we don't have words in Judaism for God. Oh, we don't have words in Islam for God. W what about India? We came down to that. We're not even calling it Yehovah or Allah anymore. We're calling it that. How is that for trimmed down? And straight to the point. In science, consciousness and form are indiscernible from one another. And that's not the kind of Vivica we want. <laughs> See, we want to discern them from one another. That's the leap from the chaff right there. And this is why we're stuck. Because we don't even know there's such a thing as consciousness. It's not talked about in science. But the very theorems and the great intellectual discoveries that scientists are making are based on consciousness because intelligence comes from consciousness. To quote Vivekananda, it's the first compound. So I wrote a God bog the other day, just like I told you I would, and they're off. <laughs> See, resources out the gate, right? So I sat down right after I saw you all the other day and created the template and everything titled it, and they're off, and started writing. And look for some racehorses image coming out the gate, unless you want to do one for me. You see, So great souls, when the gate opens, they're, they just see the open terrain of consciousness in front of them. 
and they're riding these mighty steeds, you see, of the of the of the mind, you see. And they're they're adept jockeys at staying balanced. So you know, all this stuff, you see. So you you're going to have to open up this gate then, inward, to these higher realizations that the seers have had. And that's what's a saving grace for all of us, that they've had them, they've concluded for us. The work's done. And it says in the Divine Mother Scriptures, it says, why are you fretting and worrying? Uh, she's already won the victory. <laughs> it's right there in the Scriptures. She's already won the victory. So all the battles of the world have already been won by her. Uh, but you're so into the battle and so worried about which side's going to win. One side's going to win one side, and the other side's going to win the other. And one will seem evil and be good, and the other will seem good and be evil. Haven't you seen the way countries come and go? Haile Selassie I was looking at. Remember him back in the 70s? Hearing all the news about him, he's gone. Nobody thinks about him anymore. He was the rage back then. Ethiopia was like under his rule for like 40, 50 years. So you just see this march of titans, you see, all coming and going, falling, and people are so into them when they're happening. Oops, well, what's the next thing? That's one of our big faults in America. What's the next big sensation we can run towards that is different than the unchanging reality? Because it moves, because it evolves, because it grows because it dies, because it gets born again. There's a plenty of a host of reasons you know, that you could put in your shoulder bag and show people, but they're not worthy of being in Sri Ramakrishna's shoulder shoulder bag. The only thing that's worthy of that is what negates everything that's unreal. That's the only thing worthy of having until you get enlightenment itself which, by the way, you always had a, anyway because the victory's already won. See, but, you know, also that's the Advaitic secret. See. Erase that from, from the camera right now. We're jumping the gun. See. Well, that's really all I want to do with this chart because we won't get to anything else if we go through the whole thing. But you can see later how we're looking at the same three views about the origin of human beings. Then we're looking at the same three views, the origin of nature, worlds, and objects. And so it gets very interesting, but the nature of consciousness is a particularly interesting subject if you're courting freedom. And, and if you know that I'm going to need Vivica to do this, there's no better thing in the three worlds than that, to do this particular thing with, is to get free. Not dancing and singing, not meditating, nothing. You've got to make this clear distinction first between Brahman and its Maya between what changes and what doesn't, and get on the right side, get on the right page with the seers. And uh, if you do that, then when you meditate, you'll have great experiences in meditation. Then when you study the scriptures, the whole thing will be a revelation to you. Then when you dance and sing, you'll be like Sri Krishna dancing and singing. Not someone, you know, saying like, watch me now, you see. What, see how I move? Well, it's my new clothes. Do I smell good? What's real dance? What's real music? And, and how do I get the essence out of all of these things uh, with a single eye? Well, I, I keep my sort of discrimination posed, poised at all times, uh, particularly in this world. It might not be so necessary in other worlds, the Tibetan Book of the Dead says, because you, you've gotten out of this world and you're in a subtle body and you can see the light. You can also see your ancestors. You can see different wombs ready to, to suck you back into relativity. Uh, it's all nicely laid out, actually, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And uh, I'll have some references to that later. But uh, you can uh, easily get access to this chart. Of course, it's on our class. I've done commentaries on it before. But if, if you want, uh, you can uh, get a copy of this slow it down and, and contemplate it and read it, which is called manana. This is, that's part of the Vedika process is, is that you want to uh, 
do the slow down process of everything uh, so that you can make that cut in the right place in the right way. Then um, this chart I've put up for you to see the rest of the first half uh, because like I said when you become an adherent to the path and you set your foot on it and hopefully then you've got this sort of discrimination already. It might not be fully wetted and sharpened and honed yet, but, but you have it and you have, have it on good authority by realized souls that this is the way to do it. This is the way you're going about things. And you're going to be looking for things in your mind, not out here. I mean, oh, gee, you know, last, last year I made great spiritual projects because I gave up drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes. It's not like that. You see. That's not spirituality or lack of spirituality. Um, you're, getting, you're getting to things in the mind that are these impurities that shouldn't be there and finding out how to cut them away. And you're doing it. See? The guru ruins everything by thinking that he teaches. He should just stand back, you know, give the teachings, remove a few obstacles in the way and push you. See, then you do it yourself. You'll become adept and expert. You'll become a Jivan Mukta in this very lifetime or soon thereafter. So I'm going on vacation, packing his bags. I'm, going, I'm making preparations for my next lifetime. I'm packing a different bag. And the sword is the main thing in that bag. Make sure I take this when I leave the body and head for my next lifetime. So um, I'm going to cut away everything superfluous from before I die so I can, I can make a conscious exit. And this is the way people are, uh, some, some souls are thinking. See the, too much karma, too many samskaras. Uh, I started too late. Whatever the problem is, uh, they're thinking. Uh, and there are scriptures to support it, like the Tibetan Book of the Dead. I have to get on this, this winsome way, uh, not the winding way, see, but the winsome way. It's how to go straight to the goal and make as much progress towards it as I can in this lifetime. So, Kama Mukti. Uh, it's going to be gradual. I'm going to take these teachings by stages and digest them as I go along because then I won't backslide. One of the God blogs I wrote recently was this really steep hill and this, this, this young man is just falling back off it. He's, he's got a long ways to go and I mean the thing is really steep. So I, I was talking about falling off the path. And there are two things which the father of yoga advises about that. Well, let's just do some asanas and do some breathing exercises and then we're going to be yogis. This is nonsense. The two things that keep you from falling off the path, or the two things that cause you falling off the path if you don't have viveka, are alabdha bhumi katva and anavasti tatvani. Okay, let's go on now that you understand that. Both of these two are connected. See, one is uh, making headway on the spiritual path, but uh, always falling back. So, say you, st you know, it's like the glut of gurus and the mass of mantras and the plethora of paths. You see, that's what they're all mistaking spirituality for. How many gurus can I have? How many merit badges can I pin on? You see, how many mantras am I going to take and so forth? This is what people are doing. And uh, so that's the other problem, is convincing myself that I'm a failure. Every time I take a guru, take a path, and take a mantra, and I don't follow through with my original intention, then I create a subtle problem in my mind called I'm a failure, and I'll never be able to succeed at spiritual life again. And this is a teaching from 100 and or 140 AD. Father of Yoga was seeing this in the Indian people. 
Vivekananda saw it in the Hindu people of today. A man came up and said, oh, I'd really like to get free like you, Swamiji, but I've got all these karmas. I'll, that's going to be hundreds of lifetimes. And Swamiji said, don't think that way. Blast your karmas right now. Here, I'll show you how to do it, you see. So, yes, part of it is the mental perspective you take up. Right perspective we were talking about last week and at satsang the other day to keep right orientation in the picture. But then you have to watch out for these despoilers. That's the English word they chose for the yogic, despoilers. They, they spoil the whole picture because you start to make some progress and you, you give up that particular track you're on. So you take one step forward and it falls two steps back. But that's not the only problem. The problem that results after that is that inside you think, I failed that. And people are doing this all the time with jobs, relationships, you see. They just lose the courage of their convictions. And it's not doesn't please them. You see, what they took on themselves doesn't please them. It dis disappoints them. So this is going on. This is why this is lack of discrimination in the world. But when you get to the spiritual path, you should have higher discrimination than that to be able to say, if, you know, if, if I saw the teacher and I saw the path and I got the mantra and that was my original intention and this teacher was heading me towards a goal, then I should stick with it. Any religion can do that for you if you do it right. Any teacher can do it for you if, if he or she is authentic. And any of those also can fail you if you yourself don't follow through with them. So this lack of follow through is uh, mock progress and then failing. And then that's only half the problem. Now you've got a habit of failure in your mind. You may not even know it. You see. Oh yes, I, was, I, I followed the spiritual path all my life. Now, who's your teacher? Well, let's see, you know, get out a piece of paper. You know. <laughs> tell you how many teachers I had. What was your mantra? Oh, I had, I know lots of mantras. See? So those two despoilers are what I started out saying, Bronte Darshana. That's what makes you see falsely. Bronte means deluded. Darshana means to see clearly. So your, your seeing is, has been marred. I mean, when the horses, you know, and they're off. You see, they're out the gate, right? And they see the terrain of open sky of awareness laid out before them. And they've got blinders on. You see, what are those blinders on a racehorse, on a winning racehorse? Because blinders on back in the world, you know what those would be. We just described them. But the blinders on the racehorse are stopping the soul from seeing all of Maya. It's shutting out all distractions. So it's just the path and what they see in the future, what they see in the distance. And whether that's lifetime to lifetime or whether that's I'm going to attain it in this lifetime, and those are right perspectives. And uh, you have to commit to them. So you, it, it has to be a full commitment your whole lifetime. You can't fall off it. It's, it's not allowable. They say to rest is allowable, not to quit. So in the remaining few minutes, I can introduce this chart, uh, and we can get to it afterwards. But this, this chart that we just looked at, you can see that it's talking a lot about uh, birth, life, death, and rebirth in the right perspective. And this is how Holy Mother puts it in more current terms. She says there are three main factors in the pursuit of enlightenment. And there they are right there. Karma, practice, or uh, sadhana, if you want to put it in Sanskrit, and time, kala. Karma, sadhana, and kala would be the Sanskrit for that. So she says about karma, human being, today it is, tomorrow it is not. No one will accompany a person after death. Only action, good and bad, will follow, even after death. So she's telling us in a very short, simple way 
about the nature of one's karma and how it follows you, like the actions you know, in this lifetime. So this is why we're saying li a birth, life, death and rebirth is based all in karma. And uh, if, you, if your intention is not to be reborn again, then you're looking to take all your karma, put it in a bundle and throw it in a river. Vivekananda said, if you want freedom right now, take everything, wrap it up in a bundle, tie it together and heave it in, in the river and be done with it and be free. So that's a monastic life. And that's that's a, uh, a life of a recluse or a sannyasin. There's the path of kings and the path of the sannyasins in India, the path of kings and like Ashok and so forth, these great kings who are at the end of their lifetime, they have everything they need. But they also have a few more years till they're free. Their life, last lifetime was of, was of a king. It's like in the realm of the seers, their last lifetime is a god. You'll take a, the Tibetan book says you'll take a lifetime as a god is a very good thing. And if you do happen to turn, return to earth from the realm of the gods, You'll be a very powerful person here. Or a very powerful asura, <laughs> very powerful negative force here, or also come from the realm of the gods. Like wrathful and benign deities. About practice, she says, through spiritual practice, the ties of the karma are cut asunder. So right one, two, you see, the sort of discrimination is cutting. She tells us about karma, and then she tells us how to cut it asunder by spiritual practice. And uh, mantra was her favorite. And it's also one of the best for us you know, to come to point, to, to, to pay it all forward, to be current, is the mantra. because. Who has the time to do all these rituals? And who has the time to study all these scriptures? Who even has the wherewithal to do it when you haven't been raised in the Dharma and your parents didn't tell you about it? Your society isn't down with it, doesn't believe in it at all. It's, not, it's going in an entirely different direction. Stumbling stupidly through samsara. <laughs> it's, it's like a, you know, right in a 2,000-year-old scripture. So spiritual practices will break ties of past karma. But the realization of God cannot be achieved without ecstatic love for God. Do you know the significance of japa, I was just saying, and other spiritual practices? By these, the dominance of the sense organs gets subdued. So if you're caught in the sense organs, and that's your only life, Sense or organs, sense objects, pleasure I get from that, the pain that comes from that, which I then deny and keep going back again without learning my mistakes, uh, then that's the road of materialism. That's a Bahutva Marga, or that's Gabharga. This is my teacher used to say. People would be starting to fall asleep in this lecture, and you go, Gabharga! <laughs> But then there's also Paramartika, the supreme path, you see. So otherwise, with the sword of, of Vivika, you can subdue the sense organs. My, then he would follow this up. The teaching said, we do not want to give freedom to the senses. We want to get freedom from the senses. So when he had our attention, this materialistic Westernized society, 40 or 50 of them sitting there in pews in the Vedanta Society in Portland at that time, as he, uh, and, and sitting there for decades in front of listening to his talks. And when he had our attention, he'd, he'd give us these, uh, insert these very powerful teachings to make us sit up and think about what we were doing, what kind of life we were living, how much time we had left to do it, to accomplish it. And what, 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 why am I here? What is the great goal? What am I doing? Am I spinning my wheels? Is time running out? Sit up and take note. Two world wars are on the, are past. The third is on the horizon. You Americans better wake up. 
she said. That, that teaching that he said in 1970 is very pertinent right now with the politics the way it is and everything. It's prophetic. So before, I know we've run out of time for the first half, but let's finish this third point of the attainment of enlightenment. She says time. So here's where she gives that conciliation to us. Uh, this is the Krama Mukti way. People can't just reach enlightenment poof like that except through the grace of God. And the grace of God is usually combined with sadhana. You get the grace of God by showing God that you want to be free. The best way to do that is to, is to do your practice. And what we're saying, do it with the right orientation. Jump into it blindly. That's a different kind of blinders you're talking about not taking account of the scriptures, the guru, and what comes from your own practice. So she says here about time, or does she say anything about time? She just lists, in kala, time, you recall life's true purpose. I just pretty much read the right act on that. What am I doing here? What's this, What's going on? Am I making progress? Am I fooling myself? Discrimination, discrimination. Go on retreat and pilgrimage. Seek out a spiritual path. Find an adept guru. Select an ishtam. Ishvarakoti or antaryami, an inner ruler to guide you in your path. Take final refuge in God. That's that conclusion. And fulfill all desires in the Dharma after that. So you, you bring everything current and then your Prabhupada karma is left over. So you, you can't get rid of that. You have to live it. That's the karma you took on from before and it's got to be lived. There's no way to get out. It's, it's an arrow already shot from the bow. An arrow that's being in, put into the bow. I can tell Ram, give me that arrow back. You see. And uh, an, an arrow that's in the scabbard, please don't shoot that one, see. But that arrow that's been shot from the bow, you better hope you aimed right. And that's what we'll get into in the second half with some of these teachings about the Tibetan Book of the Dead and, and how to aim right in this lifetime for a conscious death that will put you in a better lifetime. It's said in many ways, and uh, it may not be the best case scenario, but it's practical for most people. Her teachings in this way are middle path, just like Krishna's and Buddha's were. They're middle path teachings for lots of people, for for the best of us who, who want to attain realization in this very life or soon thereafter, the quicker the better. So here we'll have our break. Thank you. Namaste.